take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. And tonight we're going to deal with Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through uh, 14. And I want to talk tonight about a greater tabernacle. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 through 14. But look at verse number 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So I want to talk about this, uh, this idea of a greater tabernacle. Now, everybody in the world has two basic problems. Um, I mean, we have more than two problems, but there are two basic problems that we have, mankind has. And I would just say that the first problem is, uh, what, what, how do I bring myself into fellowship with God? How do I have access with God? You know, the man was created to enjoy God, right? The Westminster Confession says the um, purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's man's ultimate purpose. And uh, this is the way it was in the Garden of Eden. God had fellowship with man. Man enjoyed access to God. But as you know, when Adam sinned, man was expelled from the presence of God. And so the heart of man has been restless ever since then. It was Augustine who said, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. Now the second general problem that mankind has is what sin has done to him on the inside. Remember that when Adam and Eve sinned, they felt something they had never felt before. Uh, when they sinned in the garden before that time, of course, they were innocent, and uh, they had a new emotion, however, after they sinned. When they lost their innocence, they felt shame. And so in, in Scripture, the birth of the conscience then is seen in the Garden of Eden with the fall. Um, with the eating of the forbidden fruit came the birth of the conscience. And before that, the conscience was unnecessary because there was no sin. But with the fall came the sense of right and wrong, and came the conscience then. And so the sense of guilt over the actions committed overwhelmed man to where he felt this sense of, of shame. And so man's conscience has been loaded down with guilt, this sense of guilt that the conscience or the soul bears. I was reading an interesting article uh, it said uh, this, it was talking about um, potato workers in a field. Uh, it says this, years of hoisting these huge bags have led to multiple complaints of neck and back problems by Colorado potato factory workers. And that's where the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health comes in. They did an exhaustive study, and this is what they said. They said the spine is a sensitive mechanism. Over time, improper lifting can cause irreversible damage that can lead to permanent injury. Necks and backs are not designed to carry 100-pound loads in such a way. And uh, they said, you can handle that for a little while, but continually carrying that big of a load, it does your, your neck and your back much damage. And I was thinking, reading that, our soul is much the same way. Uh, it is a delicate balance. It's as delicately balanced, I should say, as the body, um, perhaps even more. The soul can carry certain burdens. But there's one burden that the soul was never designed to carry continually, and that's the burden of guilt. And so guilt is the emotion and the spiritual weight of unresolved sin. And it is guilt that causes man to do all kind of crazy things, to act irrationally. And so uh, the question is, what do you do? What does man do with the guilt? Like physical pain is to the body, so is guilt to the soul. Sin has so stained the conscience and the soul of man that it's loaded down with this burden of guilt. Now, thank God that before man even fell, God in heaven already had the solution. Did you know that? Before man, man even fell, uh, God had a solution. And in fact, in the Old Testament, God gave a giant object lesson to Israel 
which pointed to how he was going to deal with these two problems, the problem of alienation and the problem of guilt, being loaded down with guilt. Now, let's remember the, the purpose for the writer of Hebrews. What was he trying to do? He was trying to persuade Hebrew Christians who had made a profession of faith and who suffered persecution because of it and who were considering turning back into Judaism. He was trying to persuade them not to make that mistake. That would be a huge mistake to turn back around. The old covenant is inferior to the new covenant. Remember, we looked at this in chapter number 8. Remember that we have a better covenant. It is ministered by a better priest. It is mediated from a better place. It is made of better promises. And you remember the promises of the new covenant are written on the heart, whereas the promises of the old covenant are written upon stone, and they really can't change who you are. The promises of the new covenant are written on the heart, there's the promise of grace and the promise of an inner change, the promise of the forgiveness of sin. In short, it's just a better deal. How many of you are always looking for better deals for things? Well, the Hebrew writer was saying to these Hebrews, look, the new covenant is just a better deal. And you're a fool if you don't take advantage of this new covenant. And you're even more of a fool if you have already made a decision to trust Jesus, to turn back away from that, and to go back into the old covenant, because the old covenant is a shadow. It is a picture of the reality. Let me give you an illustration. I know you all know that my daughter, Abby, gave birth to our second grandson, uh, Owen. And, uh, you know, before that, leading up to the delivery of Owen, Abby had these pictures through the wonder of medical science, we were able to look at these sonogram pictures. We all have those, right, of our children before they're born, at least the newer generation. We didn't have that in my generation, right? But, you know, when you get these little sonogram pictures, they're really wonderful, and we rejoice over them, don't we? We look at those things, we kind of hold them up into the light, and we can distinguish um, a little face there. We can distinguish a baby there. But let's just say that after Owen was born... And by the way, I rejoice in looking at those pictures. But after Owen was born, and, and, and Abby wants to bring Owen to me and say, Dad, would you like to hold Owen? And I say, Honey, I, I, I would rather look at this picture here. I would just rather look at the, the sonogram picture. And uh, I ignore the baby because I am obsessed over the picture. You say, I can't think of anyone that would be that stupid, that foolish, as to say, I'm more interested in the the shadowy picture than I am the reality. But you know what? That's exactly the mistake that the Hebrew Christians were making. By turning back into the old covenant, in essence, what they were doing is they were saying, we're more interested in the shadows, the pictures in the Old Testament, the pre-coming pictures of the Messiah, than we are interested in the Messiah himself. Now, by the way, there's nothing wrong with uh, you know, me looking back at those pictures and reminiscing about Owen before he was born, but to, to, but to ignore him and to obsess over the pictures, that's ridiculous. That's what the Hebrews were doing. They were turning away from Christ, and they were looking at the shadowy pictures. And so what the writer of Hebrews is doing is he's pointing out that very mistake. He's saying, you're making a foolish mistake. You're ignoring the reality for shadowy pictures. So in chapter 9, what he does is he compares the two covenants, we could say. He compares the pictures with the reality to show them the mistake that they're making. Um, now, now when, when he does that, he doesn't, he doesn't speak ill of the Old Testament pictures. He says they serve their place. They had their purpose, but that purpose is over. You know, when I look at the sonogram pictures of my grandson, they were wonderful in their time, but now that the baby has come, guess what? That's over with now. The reality is here. I'm more interested in the reality. And so this is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to teach to these Hebrew Christians. So I want to examine this tonight, and I want to look at it under three headings. I want to talk about the sanctuary examine, because in the first few verses, he's going to talk about the tabernacle. He's going to talk about the pictures. Secondly, I want to talk about the service explained. He'll talk about some of the services that went on in the tabernacle. And then thirdly, I want to talk about the Savior exalted because it, he's going to compare the picture, so to speak, with the reality. 
and show how that Jesus is so much better. So number one, if you're taking notes, write down the sanctuary examined. The sanctuary examined. And what we're going to look at basically then is the tabernacle. And I think all of us perhaps have seen pictures of the tabernacle. We've seen um, images of it that show us what it must have been like in Old Testament Israel. And of course, you know that the tabernacle dwelt in the center of the camp. Did you know that semi-nomadic tribes, when they traveled in the uh, that world back in that day, the king always was, his tent was always in the center <clears throat> of the camp. The fact that the tabernacle was always in the center of the camp meant that God was their king. And you know, in the Old Testament, it talked about the pillar of fire, the glory that dwelt right above the tabernacle right there in, uh, in the wilderness over them. But notice what he says. Look at verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had the manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. So he's going to talk about different facets of the tabernacle. And first he's going to talk about the outer court of the tabernacle. If you look in the picture, you'll notice just outside the tabernacle there, within the, the fence and the gate, is the outer court. And the outer court, and by the way, we know what the tabernacle is. It was a movable tent that God commanded Moses to build. This is so God could dwell among his people, tabernacle among them. And of course, later in the New Testament, the Bible would say the word became flesh and what? Dwelt, or the same word there, tabernacled among us. And so it is a picture of Jesus. But you can see the basic outer court there. There's the uh, bronze altar and the bronze laver that stood on the outside just in front of the first veil. And by the way, that's how it was set up. <clears throat> the tribes of Israel were situated around the tabernacle in a very specific spot that the Bible talks about on each side of the tabernacle. And again, in the courtyard, you had then the brazen altar where the sacrifices were made. And then you also had the, the, the laver, the bronze laver, where the priests would cleanse themselves. And you had the tabernacle itself. The altar, of course, was made of acacia wood covered with bronze. And it had the four corners had horns where they would tie the sacrifice to. And I don't have time to go through all this in detail, but I just want to flip through some of this. The bronze laver was where the priest would come and he would cleanse himself. And the Bible made it very clear that if he came in before the Lord being unclean, that he could die. So he would go to the laver and he would cleanse himself there at that little pool of water, that little fountain of water. And so that was basically the courtyard. Um, then there is the holy place. Look in verse number um, 2 where it says, First there was a tabernacle made. Um, the first wherein was the candlestick, the table, and the showbread. So when he talks about the first, he's really talking about the first room. When he says the first, he's not talking about the first tabernacle in the wilderness. He's talking about the first room. And what was the first room? The first room was the holy place. And what was inside the holy place? The, all, the writer of Hebrews here tells us there was the, um, the, can, the, the candlestick or the menorah, the seven golden candlesticks. There was the table of showbread uh, that was there. There was the altar of incense that was in there. All these things you could see, they were labeled. So this is really a picture. If you're walking in, on the left hand, there's the candlesticks. On the right hand, there's the table of showbread. Right in front of the second veil is the altar of incense. Now, all these things point to Jesus, right? The candlesticks, Jesus is what? The light of the world. The table of showbread, he's the what? Bread of life. You guys are already ahead of me. Got an A on the exam already here. And the altar of incense, what does that represent? That represents the prayers of Jesus. That altar of incense was constantly smoking, and the smoke represented the prayers of the high priest, the Lord Jesus, really, that are constantly going towards heaven. And by the way, the incense was a special mixture that was given in the book of Exodus that um, no one else could copy. And so it had a unique smell to it. The altar of incense represents the prayers. And so the writer of Hebrews talks about this. He says, of course, you have the first room of the tabernacle, and you have these instruments in there. And then he talks about the second. Look down at verse number three. And after the second veil, that is, you come to the, 
Second veil, and what do you go into? You go into the Holy of Holies. The first veil is coming from the outer court into the holy place. The second veil is right behind the altar of incense. You go behind that veil, you come then into the Holy of Holies. And of course, the feature piece of furniture that was there in the Holy of Holies, as we know, was uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And so he describes that. He calls it the holiest of all in verse 3. Look at verse 4, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid gold round, round about, overlaid, excuse me, round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. So again, this is called the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. This, of course, is where the high priest went once a year uh, on the Day of Atonement to sprinkle blood. Again, you pass by the veil, which was a barrier between God and man, and you would enter into the holy place, or the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, where the ark was the central feature there. And again, I don't have time to go through all of this. You're going to have to really read this fast. Done? Okay. What was in the ark? Uh, there was the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments inside the ark. There was Aaron's rod that budded. Remember, some of the Israelites said, who, who died and made you boss? Who, who says you're to be the high priest? And they said, well, let's do an experiment. Let's put these, everyone put their rod in the holy place, and the one that buds will be the anointed priest. And whose rod budded? It was Aaron's, which was also a symbol that God could bring life out of death. There was a jar of manna there to remind the people that God constantly provides for them. And, and so this was, the, this was the ark. And inside then you can see those things that were there. And this is what the, the writer is describing in verse number four. He said, you know, you remember these things, you remember, and that, he doesn't really go into specific detail here, does he? You know why? Because he's writing to Hebrews. They already know all these things. So he's kind of giving them a summary. I want to remind you of this. Remind you of this tabernacle here. Remind you of the mercy seat there that was, that was on top. Look down at verse number five. And over it, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Again, he says, I'm not giving you all the details, but I just want to give you just the general um, picture of the mercy seat where you have the, the wings of the cherubim that are outstretched, and right in the middle of that is the so-called mercy seat where the blood was sprinkled on that mercy seat. And uh, he says, I can't go into this all in verse number uh, five in particular, but I'm giving you a general summary of everything that you already know, that you Hebrews know. So number one, then we see the sanctuary examined. He just kind of goes over it. But then I want you to write down number two, the service explained. Because what he's going to do in these next few verses is talk about some of the things that went on there. The services that went on inside the, the uh, tabernacle. He'll talk about the ministry of the priests. What would they do? Well, look down at verse number six, what it says. Now, when these things were thus ordained, and when he says ordained there, this is a Greek word, kataskuezo, which means to fully prepare, or we could say it like this, put in readiness, or when everything was in place, if you will. Because you remember, what did they would do with this tabernacle? They would pick it up, right? They would, they would fold it up, and they would march and then they would set it back down. Can you imagine how much work was involved in doing all that? They probably had it down to a science. Every, every priest had his part. They would pick it up. When the glory cloud picked up and went on, they would pick up and follow it. When the glory cloud stopped, they would pitch the tabernacle right there. And so the writer here of Hebrews is saying, when all these things were ordained, when it was all set up, when all the furniture was in place, when everything was ready, look at verse 6. The priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. So when it says he went into the first tabernacle, what's he talking about? He, he goes first into the old holy place, the outer court. The priests would first go in there. Now, several priests could go in there. The tabernacle had a fence around it to keep the normal people, the common people away. Only the priests could go inside the gate. And a handful of priests could go inside the holy place. And they would go in there and they would do their service. There was a lot to do there in the holy place. Uh, there was the, uh, of course, we know the table of showbread again and the seven golden candlesticks. Uh, 
They, uh, th this was the only light in that dark room. They had to constantly trim the wicks. Uh, they had to constantly um, replace the table of showbread with new bread. Actually, that was done once a week. Do you know what they did with the old bread? The, the priests had to eat it. They couldn't just throw it away. It'd be like eating day-old donuts at Dunkin' Donuts, right? Only this was a week old. After a week, the priests would eat the bread uh, that was there, Aaron and his, and his sons. It was replaced every week there on the table of showbread. So, and then they also had to make sure that the altar of incense was constantly burning incense. They had to keep the coals hot on the altar and replace those coals with new coals. Do you know where they got the new coals to put on the altar of incense? Anybody know? They got them off the brazen altar that was in the outer court. You couldn't get them from anywhere else. If you took coals from anywhere else and put it on the altar of incense, that was called what in the Bible? Strange fire. And you remember, Aaron had two sons, Nadab and Abihu. You remember they offered, what does the Bible say? Strange fire. You know what they did? They took coals from some other place than the brazen altar and put it on the altar of incense. And what did God do? In Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, God uh, basically punished Aaron's sons. They were struck dead because of that. And by the way, in the story in Luke chapter 1, Zechariah, the high pr uh, priest, or not the high priest, one of the priests who went into the holy place and he offered incense on the altar of incense and saw an angel there and became, you know, lost his voice, couldn't speak after that. That was right there at the altar of incense. Uh, they're in the holy place. Um, of course, we know that story. And so what would they do after? Th that was their service. They would take care of the things in the holy place. Look at verse 7. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. So here's the second room. The outer room, they would trim the wicks. They would replace the bread. They would put incense on the altar the inner room, the Holy of Holies, now wait a minute, not everyone could go in there. You could have a bunch of priests in the holy place, but when it came to the Holy of Holies, there was only one priest that could go there. And he could only go there one time a year. One priest, one time a year, would go into the holy place. And again, we know that that was on the Day of Atonement, what is now called Yom Kippur. Yom is, of course, the Hebrew word for day. Kippur is the Hebrew word for covering or atonement on the day of atonement. He would go in there and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat to atone for the sins of the people. Now, the priest would always wear his clothing, which was very majestic, very beautiful. Uh, all these things had symbolism in it. The, the, uh, the turban had inscribed on it, holy to the Lord. He had a tunic. He had also um, the girdle and the ephod, or he could call it the sash and the robe. And then he had at the bottom of the robe, as you know, bells and pomegranates that were at the bottom of the robe. Uh, incidentally, when I was over in Israel last year in Shiloh, with over there with Brother Mark, uh, one of the diggers found what they thought was a ceramic pomegranate that they thought could be one of the pomegranates that was at the bottom of a priestly robe because that's what they had at the bottom there. And he also, of course, had the breastplate with the 12 stones, uh, with speaking about the 12 tribes of Israel, worn over the priest's heart, which represented the fact that they were close to the heart of God. And, of course, they had Urim and Thummim, which was the, some people feel the stones that they used to cast lots that were in a pouch right behind the priest's breastplate. But he would go in there one time a year, with all of his priestly garments on, he would take blood that was offered at the brazen altar in a, that was now put in a bowl. He would go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle blood. Look what it says in there on verse 7. Verse 7 again, once every year, not without blood. He went in, but not without blood. He would go in there with blood, which he offered for who? Himself and the heirs of the people. And by the way, when he went in, he was very afraid. He was fearful. In fact, did you know, according to one Jewish writing called the Tractate Yoma, the high priest would stay up all night before praying and confessing sin and reading scripture. He wanted to make sure that when he went in, he was not going in in an unworthy way. And so, you know, the, the, the ritual, they would take two goats at the entrance of the door of the tabernacle 
they would cast lots. One lot would fall upon one goat. That goat became holy unto the Lord. That goat was taken into the tabernacle. His throat was cut. The blood was put into a bowl. The other goat, what would happen to him? The high priest would confess the sins of the nation on that goat. And then he was led away into the wilderness, never to be seen again. That was called the what? The scapegoat, right? He was led away, led away. He would go out the eastern gate. He was headed west. What does the Bible say? The Lord has separated our sins from us as far as the east is from the, as far as the east is from the west. That's a picture of that scapegoat being led away because those sins were seen no more. He would sprinkle blood on the blood of that goat. The other goat was sprinkled on the mercy seat, and that happened on the day of atonement. So the writer of Hebrews is reminding his readers about all these things, which they knew so very well. But now we see the ministry of the priest, but then I want you to write down the manifestation of the Spirit. Because now look what the writer of Hebrews does. Look at verse number 8. The Holy Ghost, this signifying. In other words, uh, notice where it says signify, signifying. This is the Greek word delu, which means to make something known. It's almost like the Holy Spirit now comes forward and says, I want to make something known. After all of this that you are being reminded about under the old covenant, the service of the priests and all of the furniture of the tabernacle, I do want to make this one thing known. Look at verse 9. That the way into the holiest of all was not yet made what? You guys with me? Manifest. So what's the Holy Spirit doing? He's coming forward. And he's saying, I want to make something very clear. Access to God was not available under the Old Covenant. Okay? Wasn't available there. In fact, who had access to God? Well, a handful of priests could go into the holy place, and only one priest could go into the Holy of Holies. All the other people had to stay back. The Old Covenant and the tabernacle system did not give you access to God. That was not yet fully made what? Manifest. The word is thaneru in the Greek to make clear. It's still not fully clear how God was going to com make complete. We're glad you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever Living Story, a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached as you've just seen. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life and He wants you to live out every day of it for His ever-living story.